Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. Come on in, out of the rain, and let's sit by the fire while I read to you. If you are new here and you enjoy what you are hearing, please consider hitting that subscribe button and also reminding yourself of every time I upload by setting the notification bell to all. If you would like to know how to become a member of Back to Ashes or would like to tip me a coffee, all that information can be found down below. With all of that being said, it is now time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Unsolved Mysteries, Volume 13. Right after this intro and ad will play, before the case starts, I'll play an ad, and after that there'll be no more ads within the video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Because these are crime stories, I must forewarn you that some of these stories may contain material not suitable for all. Listener discretion is highly advised. Oh, and before I forget, if my pronunciations sound weird to anyone, it's because I have my new set of retainers in my mouth, so certain words and phrases and stuff might sound weird. Cool? Thank you for understanding. In February of 2012, Honolulu resident Gina Rose Vendina was sifting through a trash bin when she discovered a plastic Ziploc bag with children's decomposing fingers inside. Who did the fingers belong to? On February 1st, 2012, Leela, resident Gina Rose Vendina, was picking through some trash bins near the Kukuki Gardens where she lived with a specific mission in mind. She was gathering discarded cans and bottles, which she typically gave away to elderly people who need to make a bit of quick money. As she dug through the bins, she found her typical recyclables, routine trash, cans and bottles. But this time, she thought she found something just for her, something she could use later. Ginger root in a Ziploc bag, just beginning to dry out. This was a score for Gina because it meant she would plant them in her garden and regrow their root and use it in her cooking. Happy with her finds, she threw the ginger root into her purse, gathered her cans, and left the area. Later that day, as she was drinking a soda, Gina pulled the plastic bag out of her purse and she immediately choked on her beverage. Upon inspecting the bag closer, what she was looking at didn't looked like a typical ginger root of clothes. In fact, the partially dried contents in the bag were long, thin, and had fingernails. Nervous at her discovery, Gina brought the baggie to show her friends and acquaintances in her neighborhood, all who tried to reassure that it must be monkey fingers in the bag and not to worry. Nevertheless, Gina was worried, and she took the bag right to the nearest police station. Police gathered to that area, and upon inspecting the Ziploc bag, one officer stated that it seemed these fingers were preserved at some point, as they didn't smell when he opened the bag. The fingers still had soft tissues attached to the bone. It could not be determined which hands the fingers came from, whether left or right. But no thumbs were found. Testing was done on the remains, and it is rebuilt that these six fingers, two full fingers and four partial fingers, in the Ziploc bag belonged to a child between the ages of two and five years old. However, an ethnicity nor gender could be determined during the testing. Please note, despite this, some sources state that the fingers could belong to a girl between the ages of two and four years of age, and other sources state the fingers could belong to a boy between the ages of three and five. The information discovered during testing was cross-referenced with all missing persons reports in the area of children around the ages of two through five, but no leads were found. To add to the eeriness of the discovery that fingers and trash bin were located next to a very popular children's playground, 
turning their attention to the public, children who often played at the apartments were interviewed, asking them how they felt about the recent discovery. Some children replied, Scared, said Renee Wong, 12 years of age. I'm so scared without adults. Yeah, I'm scared. Michaela Navarro, 12 years old. Scared and not going to the trash can ever, Emily Wong, 12 years old, said. The woman who found the remains was ruled out as a suspect, and local emergency rooms were also checked for children who had come in with missing fingers, but nothing was found to link the remains in the Ziploc baggie. It cannot be positively determined that the child whom the fingers belonged to was even deceased. Theories range from at-home amputations, abuse, and even grave robbing. Sadly, the case has grown cold and nothing was discovered to ever link the fingers to a missing or murdered child, and the area of Lilia has been left without answers. In April of 1999, 38-year-old and nine-month pregnant Roberta Johnson was discovered dead in a shallow grave in Ocala, Florida. She had died from blunt force trauma to the head and suffered a severe beating. Who killed Roberta Johnson? In April of 1999, 38-year-old Ocala, Florida native Roberta Vivian Johnson was busy preparing for a huge life event. She was mere days away from giving birth to a baby boy. Roberta was excited to add on to her family, eager to share the excitement and joy with only a daughter, 17-year-old Arkesha Johnson, whom she considered her her best friend. Though Roberts had only one daughter at the time, she was well acquainted with what it took to deal with multiple children at a time. Roberta was a former middle school teacher who specifically worked with troubled children. On top of that, she had also spent time in the United States Army, and, and, at the time of her death, Roberta had been employed as a bus driver. Sadly, aside from her employment history, there wasn't a lot of information available about the actual life of Roberta Johnson. Her likes and dislikes, her daily activities, her personality or favorite color or meal, for example have never been shared. The only day, the days and circumstances leading up to her murder have been reported on. On April 24, 1999, Roberta Johnson had quite a busy day. She started her morning out by driving Arkesha to Ocala High School, so her daughter could attend her Saturday morning classes in preparation for graduation, before driving Arkesha's boyfriend to his own home and dropping him off. After these errands, Roberta returned home and phoned her mother. Roberta spoke of an appointment that she had at a local Winn-Dixie at 10 a.m. While she never divulged who this mystery appointment was with, Roberta's mother assumed it was the Drayton Florence Sr., a friend of Roberta's and a fellow member of the United States Army. While it was never officially concluded and Roberta never conclusively linked them. Everyone in Roberta's life assumed that Drayton was the father of Roberta's unborn baby boy. Days later, on April 26th, Roberta was officially reported missing by her family when she never returned home after her appointment at the local Winn-Dixie. That same day, a local policeman noticed something strange in the 6400 block of Northwest 44th Avenue. There was some freshly unturned dirt off to the side of the road on the popular Lover's Lane with a Chevrolet truck hood covering the disturbed soil. Sadly, Roberta's body was lying in the four-foot shallow grave where she had been dead for days. Roberta had suffered a severe beating and had died from blunt force trauma to the back of her head. Sergeant Clint Smith, supervisor of the Marion County Cold Case Unit, has this to say about the discovery of Roberta's body. Quote, to be able to brutally murder somebody like this, to literally beat her to death and then discard her off in a shallow grave, leave her there while she was nine months pregnant, 
she was days away from having this child. So for somebody to be able to do something like that, to me, that's the worst of the worst. End quote. Roberta's car was discovered in the parking lot of the Winn-Dixie, which she had her meeting that Saturday morning. When witnesses were spoken to, they recall having seen Roberta there, accompanied by a man who had been shaking his fists at her while they spoke. The witnesses had said an altercation was clearly happening, and when they were spoken to a second time, they positively identified the man as Drayton Florence Sr. The men in Roberta's life were spoken to next, including Florence Sr. Investigators discovered that a few men had personal relationships with Roberta, and while each of them were spoken to, including her estranged ex-husband, it was discovered that they all had been out of the Ocala area on the day of the murder, having either been in nearby Orlando or Tampa. Only Florence Sr. had still been in Ocala. Florence Sr. was said to be non-cooperative when it came to the investigation and was reported that Florence Sr. was asking fellow colleagues to switch his government-issued vehicle with theirs, perhaps in an effort to confuse investigators. However, Florence's car was in fact tracked down, and when it was combed for evidence, it was discovered that the car had traces of amniotic fluid as well as vaginal discharge on the fabric seats. Florence attempted to explain those discoveries away, stating that Roberta had sat in his car the Friday prior to her disappearance, and that he was at work the Saturday morning that she disappeared, that of which his co-workers could corroborate. Drayton Florence Sr. also had motive. If the baby boy was indeed his, this would be his third child outside of his marriage. The other two mothers, one only a 19-year-old woman, who conceived his child in the back of his government-issued car, had already taken Florence to court for child support. It is said that Florence Sr. may have been worried about Roberta also taking Florence Sr. to court for the child support and putting his pension, let alone his marriage, at risk. Despite having a promising suspect, the murder of Roberta Vivian Johnson and her unborn child has never been resolved. Had her son been born, he would have turned 25 years old this year, and Roberta, 63. When interviewed for this Ocala Star banner in 2016, Arkesha, who was now a nurse and a mother herself, had this to say about the deaths of her mother and brother. The person who killed my mom, he took away my best friend. He took away a part of my heart. And it's unfair to my mom and unfair to my unborn brother, to me and my family, for someone to be so mean and take away her life and still walk around free. A quick editing note. Due to some very helpful commenters, it was discovered through articles that Florence Singer was not the father of the unborn child. Thank you for those who dug up the info. On August 23, 2012, 16-year-old Hannah Trulove had a regular day attending her local high school classes and then spending the afternoon with friends. Hannah suddenly went missing and was found stabbed to death in a stream bed the next morning. Who killed Hannah Trulove? 16-year-old Hannah Osborne Trulove was born on May 18, 1996 to her two parents, Jeff and Mona Trulove who would eventually divorce seven years later, after Hannah was born. Growing up residing primarily with her mother, Hannah would eventually move into the Cadet Lake Lanier Club apartment in Lanier, Georgia, and continue her education at Gainesville High School. Hannah was described as being a kind, loving young woman with a gentle spirit, her gentle nature lending her a soft spot for animals. She had one day hoped to become a veterinarian. She had other aspirations before becoming a veterinarian as well. At six feet tall, Hannah had wanted to get her foot in the door with modeling. 
When Hannah wasn't focusing on her future goals and ambitions, she was fostering her love of various hobbies, such as gymnastics, singing, and music. Just a normal girl living a mostly normal life in the late summer of 2012. However, it was reported that Hannah had not always attended school regularly and that there had been an open case for the True Love family regarding Hannah's truancy. On top of that, the police had become involved with the family after Hannah had made claims of altercations with her mother, stemming from her mother's drinking, which the state took very seriously due to the fact that her mother had been caught drunk driving on multiple instances. August 23, 2012 was just another normal run-of-the-mill day for Hannah. She woke in the morning, dressed and set off to school, where she spent the day learning as well as attending a meeting with a case manager about her home life. The case manager was relieved to see Hannah as she had tried to visit Hannah two days prior and was unable to find her. The two women spoke of getting her math grade up so Hannah could move on to the 11th grade math studies. After coming back home from school and settling in, Hannah spent a few hours with friends at the picnic tables right outside her apartment laughing and chatting. Hannah's friends stated that they had last seen her at 7.30 before they left for their own homes. However, when 9.30 rolled around and Mona hadn't seen or heard from her daughter, she became worried enough to know something was very wrong and reported Hannah as missing at 10.15. While investigators searched, the family spent the evening worried about Hannah especially so when, during the night, it downpoured about two to three inches of summer rain. The next morning, August 24th, a man who was visiting his daughter took a walk around the apartment complex. A week prior, he had contacted management security about a manhole cover that went missing near the edge of the woods, and he wanted to check if it was ever taken care of and properly covered. Approaching the woods, the man spotted what he thought was a mannequin lying on a stream bed right next to the lake lanyard. However, when he inspected closer, he realized it was the body of a young woman who had been stabbed to death. Sadly, the body had been lying submerged underneath the water for a period of time, which had washed away much of the trace evidence and blood evidence. The girl's hair had been swept back and one shoe was found floating downstream and caught within branches. Investigators identified the young woman as Hannah True Love, and since her body was found right over the county line, it put the case in the county's hands. Speaking to witnesses, it was stated that Hannah had been spotted the night prior, sitting on some wooden stairs that had led down to the trailhead. Police believe that one or more people had led Hannah down the stream bed, either willingly or unwillingly, and that she was killed where she was found. Investigators also believe that despite the area she was killed being secluded and surrounded by trees, the apartment complex was so close and so densely occupied that someone must have seen or heard something during the act. Getting as much as they could out of witnesses and neighbors, Investigators turned to social media next, in hopes of finding a lead. Checking Hannah's Twitter account, they discovered that Hannah had been posting some ominous tweets, such as, So scared right now, on August 18th, five days before her murder. The agency investigating stated that they had to consider the possibility that a stalker was involved. But this was soon determined not to be the case and considered the ominous tweet to simply be teenager venting and drama. The county also scoured her Nintendo DS, which Hannah had used to chat with friends, but ultimately found nothing. They also followed the lead that Hannah had a secret cell phone her family didn't know about. But this, too, could never be positively determined. Investigators believe that Hannah willingly went to the location of her murder and that whoever killed her 
was someone she knew and trusted. One of the original investigators on the case, Detective Franklin, strongly believes that she was in the presence of more than one person at the time of her death, stating, quote, who we try to reach are not necessarily the people that had the knife in their hand, but anyone that was present and maybe would be less culpable and didn't have as much responsibility, but was just there, maybe in a situation they didn't want to be in, end quote. In 2015, Detective Franklin held a press conference asking the public to be on the lookout for a specific silver car and stating that many persons of interest had been ruled out after being spoken to and passing polygraphs. He held tight to the notion that more than one person knows that happened to Hannah that night in 2012, saying to the public, We've had several persons of interest that we've talked to that remain persons of interest. What we're looking for is someone on the fringe, someone with knowledge that has a piece of information that'll open the door to these people that we've already looked at but aren't ready to discount yet. In fact, Franklin believes that they know who the killer is but just haven't been able to arrest them, saying, we're confident we know who is responsible for her death. We've had a suspect since the beginning. Our issue is that we have a lack of evidence to tie that person to the crime. It's not to say that we have zero evidence, but we just didn't have enough. He later revealed to the public that their suspect is a male acquaintance to Hannah, and this man has continually denied any involvement in the murder. Hannah's mother, Mona, passed away mere weeks before the 10-year anniversary of her daughter's passing in August 2022. Despite Detective Franklin receiving a promotion to lieutenant in 2018, which meant he wouldn't be in charge of specific cases anymore, he pleaded to stay on Hannah Trulove's case. Hannah's case felt personal to him, as he had a teenage daughter himself, and he couldn't fathom the pain of losing her in such a way that Hannah was lost to Mona. To this day, Detective Franklin keeps Hannah's Nintendo DS on his desk as a reminder to never give up searching for justice in Hannah's case. Sadly, no justice has been found yet, and Hannah Trulove's case has remained unsolved nearly 12 years later. Before I get started with this next case, I'm pretty sure a lot of you have heard this, but I always continuously narrate this victim's story because it's so bizarre. Hang tight. This one's a wild one. Joshua Maddox, bizarre death of teenager found inside a chimney. What happened to Joshua Maddox? On May 8, 2008, Joshua Maddox set out for one of his usual walks, but this would be the last time his family ever saw him. It wasn't until 2015 that his body was discovered, wedged inside the chimney of an abandoned cabin less than a mile from his home. Authorities quickly ruled Joshua's death as accidental, leaving his family, friends, and the local community bewildered. This conclusion ignored various suspicious circumstances, including an alleged murder confession by a man who left town immediately after Joshua's disappearance. This is the strange story of the death of Joshua Maddox. Who was Joshua Maddox? Born on March 9, 1990, Joshua Maddox was the youngest son of Michael and Roberta Maddox. Growing up in Woodland Park, Colorado, a town surrounded by wilderness and campsites, Joshua developed a deep love for nature and the outdoors. Joshua was a talented teenager, dividing his time between exploring the outdoors and engaging in creative pursuits like playing musical instruments and crafting a comic book series titled Stickman and Smiley. His sister Kate described him as highly intelligent with a unique sense of style, often seen wearing a top hat 
and carrying a briefcase to school. The Maddox family faced a devastating loss on June 1, 2006, when Joshua's eldest brother, Zachary, committed suicide just before his high school graduation. This tragedy deeply affected Joshua, who had viewed Zachary as his best friend and role model, leading him to become more introverted. Despite his grief, Joshua continued to immerse himself in music and nature. His family noted that altogether he was mourning. He retained his happy and free-spirited demeanor. On the morning of May 8, 2008, 18-year-old Joshua told his sister he was going for a walk. That was the last time she saw him alive. Disappearance of Joshua Maddox When Joshua didn't return home on the night of May 8, his family wasn't immediately concerned as he often spent nights camping. Additionally, he had expressed a desire to embark on a solo adventure, according to his sister. However, as days passed without any sign of him, his parents began to worry. The Maddox family reached out to friends and searched homeless shelters and campgrounds, but found no trace of Joshua. On May 13, 2008, his father reported him missing. The police did not prioritize the case, viewing the 18-year-old as an adult who was free to come and go as he pleased, and finding no initial sign of foul play. Despite his parents' divorce, Joshua's father refused to leave the family home, hoping his son might return. As the case grew cold, the family clung to the hope that Joshua was alive and exploring the world far from home. Everything changed on August 7, 2015. Discovery of a Body While demolishing a secluded, abandoned cabin less than a mile from the Maddox home, construction workers found mummified remains stuck in the firebox of the chimney. The remains identified as those of a young man in a fetal position, wearing only a shirt, were later confirmed to be Joshua Maddox through dental records. This discovery shattered his family, especially knowing he had been so close to home. One of the most traumatic things about this story is that the cabin he was found in is literally two blocks away from my dad's house, Kate Maddox said. We looked through every part of the woods we thought he could walk to, but that cabin never crossed our minds. The coroner ruled Joshua's death as accidental suggesting he had gotten stuck while trying to enter the cabin through the chimney. Coroner Al Bourne explained, quote, It was not an instant death. How he died is only a matter of speculation, but we know he did not starve to death because that takes many weeks. You have hydration, which can take just a few days, and the other thing would be hypothermia, which would take a day or two. We have no evidence to say which one came first, end quote. This conclusion was met with skepticism by the Maddox family, the local community, and even the cabin owner, Chuck Murphy. Inconsistent Details Chuck Murphy provided crucial details that contradicted the official narrative. According to Murphy, Joshua couldn't have entered that chimney from the top because a heavy wire grate covered the chimney's opening. The only other entry point was from the inside of the cabin, which was blocked by a breakfast bar that had been detached from another wall and moved to block the fireplace. However, Murray couldn't pinpoint whether the breakfast bar was moved before or after Joshua's disappearance. The authorities disputed Murphy's claims, with the coroner noting that crime scene photos did not match the wire mesh. Murphy insisted the mesh was removed early in the demolition process. He also mentioned finding a folded pile of clothes beside the fireplace, suggesting Joshua had been inside the cabin. The coroner reopened the case but reaffirmed the accidental death ruling. The community remained unsettled, with many feeling their tips and concerns were ignored ignored tips and a suspect. Numerous residents reported to authorities a man named Andrew Newman 
who allegedly bragged about killing Joshua since his disappearance in 2008. Newman reportedly confessed to placing Joshua in a hole long before his remains were discovered. Newman left Woodland Park shortly after Joshua vanished and was later suspected of murdering a disabled man in New Mexico, though the case was dismissed in 2011 due to the death of a star witness. Newman continued to have run-ins with the law. The coroner dismissed these claims. There's a lot of hearsay that this person was the last one to see him, and that kind of thing. But they can't give me times and specifics, and we can't generate stuff that goes back seven years. These theories could only make sense if it was multiple men involved. While the authorities have their verdict on what happened to Joshua, his friends, family, and the residents of Woodland Park remain confused. How did the teenager enter the chimney? Was it truly an accident, or was somebody else responsible? Joshua will always be remembered with love as his sister Ruth expressed. He was my best friend, and he always inspired me to strive for greatness. Josh would tell me that one should never say anything bad about anyone else, ever, and I tried to be more like him. Josh was one of the nicest people I have ever met, and I am very proud to be his sister. The Short Family Murder, Virginia Case Still Unsolved Decades Later Murder in a Quiet Community On the morning of August 15, 2002, the lifeless bodies of Michael and Mary Short were found in their home. Both had sustained a single gunshot wound to the head. Their killer had cut the phone lines leading to the Short House, indicating that the murders had been premeditated. Missing from the scene was the couple's nine-year-old daughter, Jennifer. Friends and family hoped that Jennifer had somehow managed to escape unharmed, but it soon became clear that she had been abducted by the same person responsible for the killing of her parents, suggesting that she was the true target of this attack. Several weeks later, the skeletal remains of Jennifer would be discovered in a creek approximately 35 miles away from the family home in Oak Level, Virginia. She, too, had been shot in the head. Decades later, a resolution in this case remains elusive. Who murdered the Short family? The Short family. Michael Wayne Short was born on February 18, 1952, to parents Billy and Annie. He and his first wife had three sons, Kenny, Tim, and MJ. One of the seven children, Mary Frances Hall, was born on April 20, 1966, in Franklin County, Virginia, to parents George and Margaret. After Michael's divorce, he began dating Mary, and the two eventually got married. Their only child, Jennifer Renee Short, was born on July 12, 1993, in Virginia. Jennifer who was about to enter her fourth grade at Fisbro Elementary School, was a sweet and cheerful girl who was close to her parents. They were very protective of Jennifer, extremely protective, said Frank Arrington, Michael's uncle. They worshipped the ground she walked on. The family resided in Quiet Oak Level, where Michael owned and operated a company, MS Mobile Home Movers, they were known to be very kind people, and they also kept to themselves. They were good people, quiet, a family friend remembered. They never bothered anybody as far as I know, just down-to-earth, everyday people. Their last night. Because Michael's business was beginning to flounder, the Shorts were struggling financially and had to recently put their house up for sale. Their plan was to move into a mobile home temporarily, but they hadn't done this yet. The day of October 14, 2002, played out uneventfully for the Short family. Chris Thompson, one of Michael's employees, 
came over and worked on a truck with him until late into the evening. According to Thompson, when he left, the entire family, including nine-year-old Jennifer, was still awake and nothing seemed out of the ordinary. The last reported sighting of the family alive came at around 11 p.m., where they were spotted at Burger King picking up a late meal. Michael and Mary found murdered. At 9 a.m. the following morning, Chris Thompson arrived at the short home. He and Michael were supposed to go pick up a truck in Christiansburg for Michael's business. Thompson noticed that the garage door was still open and stepped inside. Upon entry, he made a shocking discovery. 50-year-old Michael was laying dead on his couch inside the garage, where he often slept so that Mary wouldn't be disturbed by his snoring. He had been shot in the head once with a 22 caliber weapon. Thompson frantically went in search of the rest of the family and came across 36-year-old Mary's lifeless body in bed. She, too, had been killed with a single gunshot wound to the head. It appeared that both Michael and Mary had been murdered while they slept, and by someone who apparently knew the family well enough to be familiar with some of their habits, such as the idiosyncratic fact that Michael usually slept in the garage. Jennifer was missing from the house. Her bed was unmade and her pillow was on the floor, suggesting that she had been taken from her room. It also looked as if the bed had been moved approximately two inches. Thompson notified the police of this horrifying discovery, and the investigation began in earnest. Troubling Clues Investigators arrived on the scene and immediately noticed that the phone lines to the short home had been cut, hinting at a chilling premeditation to the crime. They also found 22 caliber shell casings near the bodies. It seemed that nothing had been stolen from the house, including $600 in cash that was still sitting on the kitchen counter, indicating that robbery was unlikely to be a motive for the killings. Law enforcement believed that Michael had been murdered first, although the medical examiner couldn't establish an exact time of death for either, and that both had been killed at close range. Being able to get that close would surprise me, stated Sheriff Frank Castle. This is a very unusual and bizarre case. Eerily, the words, I'm glad to see, had been written on the garage window, but it's unclear if this was related to any of the slayings. Neighbors came forward to report having seen an unfamiliar man in a red or dark colored van or pickup truck in the vicinity of the property at around 8.30 a.m. A composite sketch of this individual, who was said to be in his 40s, with a weathered complexion, was later released. He has never been identified. The Search for Jennifer An extensive search for Jennifer was launched, covering hundreds of miles and utilizing ATVs, dogs, and a helicopter. Searchers on foot and horseback looked for the girl. Additionally, a nearby lake was searched, as well as a pond close to the home. No clues as to the whereabouts of Jennifer Short were found, and the anxiety of her surviving family only increased. Frank, Michael's uncle, made a public plea for the child's safe return, even suggesting that her captor drop her off at a Walmart or any other 24-hour store. Please put a note on her. My name is Jennifer Short. I'm missing. I'm from Bassett, Virginia. Please do not harm her. At a press briefing, several members of the family wore a yellow ribbon to signify that Jennifer was still missing. They clung to the hope that she was alive and would be located soon. However, weeks would go by with no sign of the missing child. The Investigation in an effort to discern the motive for this crime, law enforcement spent two weeks searching the short home and ultimately removed hundreds of pieces of evidence, including tax returns, clothes, a 22 caliber revolver, a 12-gauge shotgun, a cell phone, and 
unspecified items of a sexual nature. Anytime you have a child abducted, you've got to assume it may have something to do with the sexual nature, explained Sheriff Castle. It's unclear if any of the items obtained proved helpful to the investigation. While some worried if the murders were motivated by a desire for revenge against Michael or Mary, others felt that the circumstances strongly suggested that young Jennifer herself was the main target. The home didn't have an internet connection in Hatton for two years, which minimalized the chances of Jennifer having met a predator online. Her friends were interviewed as well, but this didn't produce any relevant information. An incident in Mary's post soon led investigators down another avenue of speculation. While working as a seamstress for Pluma Incorporated in 1992, Mary was subject to stalking behavior at her workplace. Several times, a man visited the company, angrily demanding to see Mary. He didn't work there and was escorted out of the building. Interestingly, Mary didn't want the police to be notified and never attempted to obtain a protective order. We don't know if she was stalked per se. We know that someone at one time or another was angry with her, said Castle. We don't know who it was or what it was about. The two persons who escorted him out of the plant didn't know him either. Because Jennifer was born the following year, Law enforcement theorized that this mystery man might have been her real father, not Michael, and that the eventual killing of Michael and Mary was done out of desperation to take his daughter back. To test this theory, Michael's body was exhumed for further DNA analysis. As it turned out, Michael was, in fact, Jennifer's biological father. So, this potential lead ended up being another dead end. Jennifer is found. In October 2002, approximately six weeks after Michael and Mary Short were found murdered, Jennifer's remains were located in a creek in Stoneville, North Carolina, around 35 miles away from her home. The discovery was made by law enforcement after a local resident alerted police when his two dogs brought him bones, including a piece of a human skull. It was concluded that Jennifer had sustained a single gunshot wound to the head, just as her parents had. Due to the advanced state of decomposition of her remains, her time of death could not be determined, nor could any abuse that she might have suffered prior to being killed. Jennifer's loss was another devastating blow to the family and the community as a whole. No clear suspects. From early on, investigators had several persons of interest, but no solid evidence that made any of them stand out. We have some people that we're looking really strongly at, but we had no concrete evidence, noted Castle. We're looking at anyone, but we're looking more strongly at certain people. Chris Thompson, the employee who discovered the bodies of Michael and Mary, was ruled out as a suspect. Michael had numerous employees over the years, many of whom were transients looking for a short-term work. These laborers often stayed at a hotel down the road from the short distance during the time working for him. Could one of these men have been the perpetrator? Someone who had access to the family for a time, perhaps got to know them just well enough to learn some of their habits? Because these workers came and went with regularity, authorities found it challenging to locate some of them for questioning. He had more occasional employees than we realized, noted Castle. Suspect, Garrison Bowman. The investigators would get their first break in the case when a promising lead materialized. According to a tip, a carpenter named Garrison Bowman, 66, allegedly harbored a grudge against Michael Short and had told someone that he might have to kill a man in Virginia who had failed to move his mobile home even after Bowman paid him to do so. Notably, 
Jennifer's remains had turned up approximately one mile away from the property of a friend of Bowman's, where his mobile home was located at the time. His landlord also claimed to have witnessed Bowman with a pistol on August 15th. Bowman, who fled to Canada, was eventually extradited to the United States, where he was held on charges related to a violation of immigration laws and drunk driving. He appeared before a grand jury in Roanoke, Virginia on November 12th, but no indictment was returned. There was nothing concrete to tie Bowman, who reportedly had an alibi, to the murder of the Short family. In 2007, authorities revealed that he was no longer considered a person of interest in the investigation, and that the man who had implicated him had fabricated a story, hoping to collect the reward money. According to U.S. Attorney John Brownlee, these individuals told law enforcement that they'd spotted Bowman leaving the short home on the night of the killings, carrying a young girl. This was apparently the story around which investigators had attempted to build a case against Garrison Bowman. These men would go on to be convicted of perjury and providing false information to law enforcement, leading to their incarceration. To date, Bowman has been the only suspect ever officially named in a case that continues to evade resolution. The Annual Motorcycle Ride The Oak Level community has never forgotten the Short family and continues to host an annual bicycle ride to raise awareness about the case. The route takes the motorcyclists across the North Carolina Bridge since renamed the Jennifer Renee Short Memorial Bridge beneath which Jennifer's skeletal remains were discovered. The loss of Jennifer Short is just one of those things that I'll never forget, said one of the organizers of the event. It's just as vivid today as it was 20 years ago. New tips pour in each year after the annual event, but so far no substantial leads have been forthcoming. Other Developments Garrison Bowman passed away in 2014. The short residence was auctioned off on December 7, 2002, but had been vacant for months when it mysteriously burned down in 2019. How does the house catch on fire? inquired Michael's sister, Carolyn. We didn't have a storm. There was no electricity in the house for months. They've cleaned it up quickly so it seems to me that something is trying to be hid. The exact cause of the fire has never been conclusively determined, or if it has, that information has never been released to the public. Notably, though, a gas can was recovered at the scene, indicating that arson is a plausible explanation. However, investigators stated that they didn't believe the blaze had any connection to the murders that occurred there nearly two decades earlier. The case was officially reopened in 2021. We believe there is someone out there who has information that may solve this case, announced Sheriff Lane Perry. We encourage people to come forward with that information, no matter how small it may seem. Perry continued. Across the country, we've gotten more inquiries about this particular case than I've seen my entire career in law enforcement. I can't imagine what the Short family and their relatives had to go through. But we've been in contact, and we will stay in contact. I consider y'all family because you've helped me keep the dream alive about this investigation and solving this case. With the case still being actively investigated, there is a renewed hope that the murders of Michael, Mary, and Jennifer Short will one day be solved. Oh.
Alrighty, dear listeners, this brings a close to these true unsolved mysteries, volume 12. Before I go any further, I would like to give a very special shout out to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elias, Sugared Spike, Tina Mead, Samantha Play, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Luz Crispin, Patty's niece, Denise S, Homie Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Again, thank you so much for remaining the pillars on which Back to Ashes stands. And to the subscribers and listeners, thank you so much for your support. For without any of you, I would not have a voice. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed these cases. In the meantime, please take care of yourself and stay vigilant out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourselves a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.